Uh, some people are going to come around. You're going to get people are going to pass out a verse sheet. There's only about 250 of them because some of you are going to read it and some of you are well, just not going to. Look on with somebody. But this is a pretty scripture intensive chapel that we're going to do. So we're going to be going through scripture. You've got a bookmark in front of you. And normally when I was, well, normally, when I was teaching seniors, I would go through that bookmark. The did, top ten, or to, at least ten things to remember. Ten things that I wanted seniors to remember. And so this chapel, in a lot of ways, is for the seniors. But I want the rest of you to listen in because I do think that there's some important things here. Otherwise, I wouldn't give you ten things to remember. I also understand that it's hot. So I have a list of five things to do to stay cool at Grace Brethren when it's hot. Take off your shirt. Way number five, working our way from five to one, two, stay cool when it's hot at Grace Brothers, to stand underneath the overhangs of the walkways in the shade. Because they may not always stop the rain, but they always shade you from the sun. Yeah. Number four is to use the water stations to hydrate. Make sure you hydrate. Speaking of which, you're going to go get my water bottle. But make sure you hydrate. Because if the more you hydrate, the more you have to go to the bathroom. And the more you have to go to the bathroom, the more you have to leave your class to go to the bathroom and step out of the air conditioning and go into the hot sun. And maybe that isn't the best way, but stay hydrated anyway. Just stay hydrated. Number three is to be intentionally late to class so that you can go hang out in the air-conditioned front office with Mrs. Moore and Mrs. Williams as they give you a tardy pass. Yeah. That is the third best like way to one. stay cool. Do not do that, by the way. Because then what happens is there's so many people that the door stays open, and then it gets hot, and then there's no air conditioning in there anyway. But some of you have tried things like that in the past. Number two. Number two re way to stay cool on a hot day, Grace Brethren, is, and this is really for junior hires, if you run up and down the field really fast, <laughs> the wind will blow faster you faster and it'll keep you cooler. So the more you run and the faster you run, the cooler you will be. That's Some of you freshmen are thinking, boy, why can't I do that too? Why is it just for junior hires? And some of you AP physics students are thinking, Mr. Nando, I don't think that'll work. But so you guys just be quiet, don't worry about that, all right? And the number one way to stay cool when it's hot at Grace Brethren is to sit in semi-air conditioned classrooms and learn from the best teaching staff in the face of the earth, right? That is the best way to stay cool at Grace Brothers. Yeah. 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 At this point, all of you should have a bookmark. Hopefully some of you have some verse sheets too. I think they're still making their way around. But we do take education of Grace Brethren really seriously, and, we, and education means preparing you for the future. So these are ten things as you leave Grace Brethren, and if you're a junior, you're right around the corner. And there's just not a lot of time left. But for seniors, you're in a scenario where you have had some acceptances probably from colleges. You've got to make a decision this month so that you can accept those acceptances and all the scholarship money that goes into it. Seniors, you are, many of you are within 25 days of making that decision, 20 days of making that decision. So I want you to be thinking about how this applies to you as you leave. Let me pray. And then we'll get started. God, thank you for today and for the opportunity we have to look at your word and to think about what it really means to live a life that's worthy of you. To think about how you love us and how we can love you better. Help us to follow you. Help us to live holy lives and help us to understand what it is to be your child. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, first thing I'd like you to remember is that you need to live a whole a life that's holy and pure before God by knowing His Word 
and turning to his word first. Psalm 119, 9 through 11. It says, how can a young man or woman keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With all my heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You want to make good choices, you have to study God's scripture and you have to memorize his word. In verse 11 it says, I've stored up your word in my heart. I've treasured your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I might not make bad choices, choices that are against the character of God. That's why I memorize his word. We don't have you memorize God's word because it's an assignment. It ends up being an assignment because we want to push you to do it. But we memor have you memorize God's word because it's the way to understand who God is, who his character is, and to live a holy life. As you seniors leave, if you want to live a holy life, then you have to be true to God's word. Which means you have to know God's word, which means you have to dwell and memorize God's word. Which leads us into Joshua 1, 8 and 9. Number two is meditate on his word day and night and be strong and courageous in the Lord. Those two actually are connected in Joshua 1, 8. Joshua 1, 8 and 9 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, think about it, dwell on it, chew on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it for then you're, you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success you want to live a successful life meditate on God's word seniors there are a lot of people who are telling you hey if you t follow this major or you go to this college or you do this or you do that then you will be successful God's word says if you meditate on God's word and going back to Psalm 119, if you live according to God's word, then you will be successful. If the last couple of years of pandemics and war and riots and protests have taught us anything, is that fame and money and popularity and you fill in the blank doesn't lead to success or happiness. It doesn't. However, living according to God's word and having a relationship with him leads to good success, according to Joshua 1. And verse 9, right? Not only will you have success, says, have I not commanded you in verse 9, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. If you live according to God's word, you don't have anything to fear. You don't. If someone were to say, okay, hey, I'd like to look at your browsing history on your phone and on your computer and on your device, all of your devices. <laughs> From your talking, I'm guessing that maybe, maybe some of you struggle with that. If you're living according to God's word, I don't care what you look at on my phone. I don't care what you look at on my computer. I don't care. Because I've been successful in living according to God's word. I don't have anything to fear. You don't have to live in fear when you live for Christ. Number three. We're already up to number three. By the way, this is super important. Seniors, if you only hear two points, maybe three, I'm hoping. This one and number 10 are my two favorites. Seniors, this is what you need to do. When you go away and you move away, you go to college, number one, you need to continue to be in God's word. Number two, you need to be involved in the church. You must be involved in the church, not just going to a church and showing up at nine o'clock and leaving at 10.30 when service is over. Being involved in the church. Number three is number three right here. Make the right friends and be a true friend. Make the right friends. That will make a massive difference in your life. Don't make friends who are popular. Don't make, hang out with people just because they're funny or whatever else. Make 
friends with people who are going to make you a better person. Make the right friends. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. If you make the wrong friends, that has an effect on you. Make the right friends. I gotta tell you, when I went to school, fortunate enough to make some really good friends, and that made a huge difference in what my college experience was like. Number four, for those of you who are Christians, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself up for me. Christians, your life is not yours anymore. It's not. Because I have been crucified with Christ, and it's Christ who lives in me. When I was a senior, at the end of March, I'd applied to two universities. The one I wanted to go to was UC Davis. I got accepted, electrical engineering major, going to play soccer there. It was inexpensive because we lived in California. It was an hour and a half from my house. It was a semi-prestigious school. I was ready to go. But God took me on a different path and said, no, I need you to go to the Biola University. And that's where I went. Seniors, people are going to ask you, where do you want to go to school? Where do you want to go to school? What do you want to do? I'm going to tell you, and don't take this the wrong way, I really don't care where you want to go to school. I don't. The question is, where does God want you to go to school? Because it's not your life you're living anymore, it's God's life. Where does God want you to go to school? Juniors, be praying every day. Where's God? That was perfect. Where's God want me to go to school? Be praying, Jesus. Where's God want you to go to school? Find out. Because it's not your life anymore. Number five. Be the man or woman of God that God wants you to be in your home, both as a spouse and as a parent. And you're thinking to yourself, you know, I'm in 10th grade. What do I know about being a mom or a dad or husband or wife? What do I know? God's word says you can prepare for this. Ephesians 6, 2 and 3 says, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. You want to learn how to be a good parent? Serve your parents. Love your parents. Listen to your parents. If they say take out the trash, don't say, I'll do it later. With a joyful heart, with a servant's heart, say, okay, get up and do it. If they ask you to do, you know, wash the dishes. Oh, sure. If you learn to serve your parents, if you learn to honor your parents now, that will help you as you grow older to be a good spouse and parent yourself. And as you go away to college, that doesn't mean you stop honoring your parents. You may, they may have less opportunity to make decisions with you and for you, but you still need to honor them as you continue to grow. Or I, at whatever age I am, 79 or whatever it is now, I still need to honor my parents. And if you learn to honor your parents, if you learn to serve your parents, you will do that in your family. Because I gotta tell you, your parents serve you constantly. If you had to pay them, for what they did for you over the past seniors 18, 19 years, you would never be able to repay it. Never. Honor your father and mother will teach you to serve. Look at that. We're already on the back side. Number six. 
incite one another to love and good works. Hebrews 10, 24. And I gotta tell you, I'm gonna be short on this, but we've heard a lot about incitement lately. Inciting riots, inciting protests, right? We've seen a lot of that. This says, Hebrews says, to incite one another to love and good works. That means provoke. Provoke people to love and good works. I'm gonna keep this point really short. What if y'all provoked each other to pick up trash on campus? Three pieces of trash per person every day. Would the campus be clean in under a week? 100%. Even, I know junior hires, easy, easy. I understand that it's not cool to say, hey, you know, you're getting up without picking up your trash at lunch. Would you pick up your trash, please? I understand it's not quote unquote cool. But when you go to college in your dorm room and people are saying, hey, let's go watch this or let's go do that. How are you gonna tell people no if you can't tell them to pick up your trash or their trash? How are you gonna say, you know what? That's not a good idea. Your friend leaving the table, leaving their trash there and you saying, hey, Pick up, the, hey, would you take your trash with you? That's a whole lot easier than when you go away and you're living on your own and people are telling you to do things that aren't right. Provoke one another, incite one another to love and good works. Number seven, and this one's a challenge. Expect trials. Be thankful for them and learn to be like Christ through them. Also learn to be content in all circumstances. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when we meet various trials, or ver trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, or steadiness, consistency. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That phrase, perfect and complete, really means mature. When I went away to the Biola University and I started playing soccer for my future uncle-in-law, which I didn't know he's going to be my uncle-in-law, but he was a wrestling coach. He was a wrestling coach, and he had a maniacal work ethic. A few years ago, probably three years ago, I did chapel just about him and the lessons I learned. But there was a hill, and you'd go to the hill, and it was 300 meters long, and it was about a 10% grade. And we'd be running up the hill, and it's only 300 meters long. We'd run up the hill, you run super hard, you kind of had your eyes closed, and you'd look up, and you'd hadn't gone anywhere and you keep running really hard really hard really hard and you look up and you didn't feel like you'd gone anywhere and then you get to the top finally and you would vomit and then he'd say all right run another and he'd go down you jog down the hill and you'd run another and the first couple of times i did it every time i got to the top of the hill i'd vomit but i will tell you that those trials in athletics help me to be a better player right if you're going to be a good athlete you can't just sit around on the sofa and then get up and go, oh, I'm gonna go play in the NBA. I'm gonna go play in the NHL. I'm gonna be a professional hockey player just by sitting on my sofa. It takes hard work. It takes trials. In 2020, we all had trials. I'll tell you that in January, I got pneumonia. I had pneumonia for five months, right, right about the time I was starting to recover from pneumonia. I got kidney stones, and that was a joy. I recovered from kidney stones, and I had one surgery, I'd, then I got two more surgeries, and right about three weeks after I'd recovered from pneumonia, I got COVID. In fact, I did a graduation ceremony up at the church, a drive-through graduation ceremony up there with COVID, and I didn't know it. And I got really sick again. Six weeks later, my mom almost died. 
and I, she was in the hospital for two months. During that time she was in the hospital, my dad went into the hospital for cancer surgery and had his esophagus removed. And all that time I'm trying to manage all of these different things. I'm trying to get better, I'm trying to help them, I'm trying to be a dad and a husband. And it stunk. But I kept thinking, God has a purpose. And I know that now I'm more mature than I was then. I know, some of you are thinking, man, Mr. Henry, you are so old. How mature can you get? Yeah, I understand. I was just needed to, I needed to continue to mature. But I wouldn't have matured as much as I did if I didn't have those trials. So even some of you have been going through illnesses. Some of you have lost people in your homes, in your families. Some of you have families... And you go home, you don't feel like it's a, a place that you want to be sometimes because there's too much arguing and fighting. I'm telling you that if you rely on Christ, you can have joy as you look to the future, not necessarily the present, but always to the future that God is doing something in your life. If you continue to come back to his word and prayer and looking forward, that you can withstand those difficult times. Because God promises that things will be better. That he's doing something in your life. Number eight, juniors and seniors in particular, but sophomores, freshmen, and junior highers. Ask God for direction in life, and he will show you where to go. The only reason I know some things is because I, is I feel like I'm old, and I have experience. But I do a lot of praying about, God, what do you need me to do? What is it that you want me to do? What should I say? A student comes to me, or that teacher comes to me, or a parent comes to me, I'm thinking, God, what do you want me to say? I don't know. Seniors, you're making decisions about college. Are you praying, God? Give me wisdom as far as where to go. What should I be doing? Number nine, pray to him, give thanks, and fix your mind on his truth because he is peace. Fix your mind on truth. We talked a little bit about prayer already. But last year, there was a professor who made a lot of news because came out and said, you know what, 2 plus 2 could equal 5 if you looked at it from, you know, your own background and your own choices. And, you know, 2 plus 2 could equal 5 in your life. I'm going to tell you, students, I have a three-word answer. No, it cannot. By the way, if you want to do checkbook, if you want to run your checkbook as and you have 2 plus 2 equal 5, you go ahead, your bank's going to tell you you're wrong. If you're an engineer and you're trying to design a building and you use 2 plus 2 equals 5, there's going to be a problem with your building because 2 plus 2 equals 4. Philippians 4 8 says this finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Seniors, as you leave, Grace Brethren, think about truth. At the end of this verse, it says, think about these things. There's a sense in the original Greek there about dwelling, living in truth. Live in the truth. Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to others. You're going to have college professors that tell you things such as 2 plus 2 equals 5. And you have to decide whether or not you're going to believe truth. You have to decide. It's on you. We had a senior, when I was here, I taught them in regards to the Miller-Urey experiment. You can learn about biology. You can look it up. And talked about how this is what scientists and professors think happened before life began, if you don't believe that there's a God. 
student went from here to a local public school, and the teacher taught it as though it was fact. And the student raised his hand and said, um, I'm just curious, I thought that this experiment was proven to be false, and it wasn't right. And the teacher said, yeah, it isn't right, and it's wrong, and we can't really prove it, but it's the best explanation we have, even though it's wrong. He was willing to raise his hand and say, I thought there was truth. Are you willing to go out and say, no, there's truth when teachers teach you false things? Where's Shauna McIntosh? Is she here today? Shauna? Oh, she already has her head down. Uh, so, Shauna's grandfather's have had a huge impact on my life. One of her grandfathers was the uh, senior, my senior pastor for 15 years. And her other grandfather hired me at Grace Brethren. I mean, I don't know if he really wanted to, but he kind of got stuck and kind of had to. But Mr. Mann was the principal here and he hired me, her grandfather hired me to work here. And when I came, I saw what he wrote into the yearbooks of the seniors. And it was 1 John 5, 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. That's really what I want to leave you with. This world is going to tell you that technology, success, money, fame, stock portfolios, Bitcoin. Those are things to be worshipped. Those are things to strive after. Those are things to sacrifice your life for. Those are things that are idols. And an idol is something that you would think is more important than God. And unfortunately, I believe we all have them at one level or another. I know there are times when I have things that I believe that I don't really believe it, but I act as though there are things that are more important than God in my life. We all have them. In John, in this letter, this is the very last verse of 1 John. Keep yourselves from idols. If I could leave you with one thing, is that keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from chasing after people or artists or money or popularity or fame or prestige or power. Keep yourselves from those idols because those are easy idols to run after. Simply focus on God. I'm going to ask you to pray. I'm going to pray, but before I do, I'm going to have you pray silently. I want you to pray to God and ask him about what is an idol in your life that you need to tear down, that you need to put away. And by the way, if you're thinking, gee, I just don't know. I mean, there's nothing that's... What is it? What would be the hardest thing God could ask you to give up? I don't know. Some of you are thinking my phone. Is your family? Is it a desire for money? Is it a boyfriend or girlfriend? What would be the hardest thing that God would ask you to give up? And is that thing more important than God? All I want you to do is pray to God and ask, God, is that really an idol in my life? And if so, please help me to seek after you through your word. I'm going to ask you to pray silently. Then I'm going to close in prayer. Then we're dismissed. However, as you leave, please remember that we're going to incite one another love and good works. We're not going to leave trash under the bleachers. Let me pray. Actually, you pray silently, and then I'll close.
Heavenly Father, we ask that we would worship you and you alone. That we wouldn't put money or family or a lot of times even we worship ourselves. We ask God that we would keep ourselves from idols, that we would worship you. And to do that, we really have to change our minds by memorizing your word and by praying, by living holy lives. Thank you for the love that you have for us. And as we come up to Easter in a couple of weeks, we thank you for Jesus' death which paid for our sins and his resurrection, which gives us newness of life. Thank you that if we believe in him, that we can have an eternal relationship with you. I pray, Father, that we would all cherish that, that we'd strive after that, and that these, the things of this world would seem very small in the light of Christ's glory and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Adios, amigos.